Hello again. We're uh, back to Romans chapter seven. So, so glad you found this uh, blog. Please tell other people about it. It's um, um, Bishop Craig Bates, CEC. Or Bishop, yeah, Bishop Craig Bates, CEC dot org. And um, there's a lot of teachings and thoughts out here, but we're we're going through uh, Romans. I'm not sure what. Uh, uh, session this is and we're doing kind of 30 minute a little bit longer sometimes segments uh and we've on chapter seven and eight treating them as one and we kind of did an introduction uh to what what's going on here and we're going to pick up uh pick up there where um god compares his relationship uh to israel as a husband to a wife and in the New Testament, we see that marriage uh, is the, the visible sign of the love between Christ and his church. And even our relationship with Christ is that we're the bride of Christ as the church. Uh, so marriage and family is very, very central. I said in the last teaching that we can make them into gods. Uh, there are people who worship their children or worship their wife. and You can't do that. There, there's certainly, I love my wife and I love my children and I love my grandchildren and hopefully God will grant me a, a great grandchild before I go home to see him. That would be a real blessing. Uh, so family is important. And the union of God and his people, that relationship of husband and wife, the, the purpose of that union is uh, to bear fruit be fruitful and multiply, we read it in Genesis. God created the male and female. And the first blessing that he gave was be fruitful and multiply, have lots of children. And unfortunately, the family today is under attack. That we see that blessing to be fruitful and multiply sometimes as a curse. To have too many children seems like a burden. It's un unbearable. And we're down to now in the Western world of having one child, and in some places not having any children at all, but uh, dogs have replaced, or cats have replaced children in uh, relationships. And the family is under attack, and marriage is being redefined uh, by the people who embrace a worldview that's based uh, not on scripture, not on God's intended word, will, and ways but uh, redefining a, a worldview that's based on the exaltation of mankind, uh, humanism, and the values, and a lot of it is values that didn't really exist until the 18th and 19th century. Humanism that um, proposed by Darwin, where creatures create themselves, or Marxism that has a state or a collection of people as um, the ultimate authority of God. Religion was seen as an opiate of the people. And Freud, uh, who I had to study forever, uh, where man is his own God. And he defines himself, he loves himself, he forgives himself, he creates himself. And uh, those created revolutions, those created revolutions in everything. Uh, and so they're basically one revolution that's still going on today, and there's still a battle, particularly in the Western world, that isn't going on in the global South, Asia, Africa, um, South America, which is why the church is growing, because it's speaking truth, but there's a hardness of heart in, uh, in the Western world, and I'm not going to deal with that right now, but uh, the rejection of God has left us open to socialism and communism, to a sexual revolution, and um, that defines the purpose of sexuality according to Hugh Hefner and Playboy magazine, and not according to uh, scriptures. And so we're living in the, that area of my body, my choice, which has led to 45 million plus abortions, from pain and suffering on so many levels to abortion, um, and and it's all wrapped up in our, our view of God and a view of 
of his purpose and his plan. And we're called to live that out. We are baptized into his into the death of Christ so that we can walk in the newness of life. Let's read Romans chapter 6, verse 3 again. Do you not know that all who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptized into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life and wholeness of life and completeness of life. That's God's plan for us. We're now set free or set, we're put dead to the law, Romans chapter 7 talks about. And we now serve God in a new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written law. It's Romans uh, chapter 7, verse, verse 6 says, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now, it doesn't say that the law is not good. The law is very good. And we should live up to the standards of the law. You know, that's not murder, that's not commit adultery, that's not covet. But especially you should love the Lord your God. Him only shall we love, to be in that relationship. There's something great about the holiness of the ultra-Orthodox. I, uh, when I went undergraduate school, the final two years, I lived in a place called Bethlehem, New Hampshire. And uh, Bethlehem, New Hampshire was uh, a spot where there were a lot of <clears throat> resorts that were open and, and um, <clears throat> created by the ultra orthodox community of Williamsburg, the Hasidim. And they created this resort so they could come and holiday there in the mountains and still keep uh, the purity codes and laws and yet be by the lake, be in fresh air outside of the city. And there was stuff for the children. And the ultra-Orthodox, I learned, I got a job <clears throat> as a dishwasher in one resort, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was a phenomenally good time for me. It's a holy time. And I was living among, I wasn't a practicing Christian. I was kind of seeking God at that time. I was enthralled by uh, the faith. I had gone back, back to church. Um, and... Uh, I didn't have a child yet, just Kathy and I. Kathy worked as a waitress in a place called Mr. Ned's. And, um, but I was, I had this job, I was going to school, and I met these people who are just, I've never met. You know, there are people, if you go to, if you look up Hasidim, Google it, the guy with the long side curls and, and special hats and outfits, and they're strictly adhere to the law. And in the center of, of, of Hasidim is the belief that the law is not a burden, that the law is a way of joy. And oftentimes, if you see pictures of the Hasidim, they're dancing and singing, that life is to be lived joyfully. God has given us life. life and, and so we, we celebrate that all the time. And so the goal of Hasidim is to live uh, not only a life of holiness, but to live a life of joy. And they believe that that Holiness produces joy uh, in the individual. And so the law is good. So the law is good. So we want to continue. What is Paul then talking about? First, the law is not sin. Um, if it were not for the law, we would not know sin. Sin, uh, sin is that which separates us from fellowship with God. Uh, and that's where the lack of joy is. So, um, excuse that in the background, that's my dog, I record. That's Toby, if you've ever met me, you'll hear about Toby. That's Toby barking at something. And uh, I don't wanna yell at him, so you just have to listen to him. Hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, anyway, so, so the law shows us what sin is. We wouldn't know sin. And sin is as which separates us from the fellowship of God, not from the relationship. And fellowship with God is fullness of joy, but 
sin missing the mark of humanity of being what it means to be human degrades our humanity being fully human and in his image is the holiness that leads to joy so the spirit is given to us to be inside us in, in our hearts remember jeremiah 31 31 is that that now written in our hearts and works obedience in our lives from the inside out rather than the outside in. Very simple. So here you have the law, that's external. You obey these, you're holy. The Holy Spirit comes inside of us, writes the law in our hearts. That holiness comes from the inside, what comes out of our hearts. So Jesus says, that's what defiles a man. It's a heart. So now our life, real life and real joy comes through Christ in us. Our holiness comes by the work of the Holy Spirit in us, yielding to the Holy Spirit. So if you looked at the old covenant, that the people of God of Israel were righteous by keeping the law or by what they do. Christians were righteous by what Jesus had done and our faith in him. We've said that already. But it's something to get a hold on. That I'm going to get into eternity, not because of what I did, but because of what he did. So the Holy Spirit also makes us, it's really great, writes the law in our hearts, but he makes us want to obey God, to want to know his will and want to know his ways. And the Spirit then will make them known. But the key is yielding to the Spirit. The moment we find that we're, we're not to do certain things, we find ourselves doing it all over the place. You ever, you ever find that a work? When the Holy Spirit reveals in us, and we're not yielded, really the issue here is that you're not yielded to God, and the Holy Spirit reveals the things that we're not to do, Something in us gives us a desire to do that. The law, which is to bring life now, in fact, brings death. There's something inside us, something basically wrong in the heart of man, and that's what needs to be changed. The law is holy. The commandment of God are holy and righteous and are good. There's nothing wrong with the commandments of God. So when you see this legalism stuff, and I said, we're just gonna throw out, you know, I'm not gonna be legalistic, so we just throw out the will and ways of God. That's not God, that's the enemy. The commandments, the will of God, the ways of God are holy. There's nothing wrong with the commandments of God. It is sin in me, which is in the heart, I will bring about my death. The wages of the sin are death, not the commandments of God. We now know, don't we? Paul's going to write in Romans 7, 14, that the law itself is spiritual. The law is spiritual. The law of God is not legalistic. But it goes on to say, we're sold under sin. Sin becomes worse when the law came because now mankind not only knows what's right and wrong, but deliberately disobeys God. Let's read Romans 7, verse 15 to 25, and it will describe what I'm talking about. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Boy, I can relate to that, can you? Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. As the desire to do the things of God, but not the ability. 
For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. Now, as we're you're digging into this, okay, don't take condemnation upon yourself. We're gonna deal with that in chapter eight. God is looking at you through the eyes of Jesus. God is looking at you through love. God is looking at you through forgiveness. If you find yourself in this position, know that you're forgiven by God. And God still loves you and will always love you and will never give up loving you, will never throw you away, will never abandon you, ever. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? Here's the answer to that. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. That's who Jesus is, the one who sets us free from this. See, there's something, that's the testimony of St. Paul, who was a holy man. I don't probably don't know even close to the holiness that Paul had. Not that I should compare myself. But he's a brilliant man. He's a seeker of God. We're going to read that incredible seeker of God. But he writes, there's something inside of us, inside of him, inside of you and me, that we just don't understand. See, you and I do not really understand completely the horror of evil. How evil is so evil. One of the things that fascinated me early on, I don't know why God did it or even was God, is I was like 10 or 11 years old when I got my hands on the rise and fall of the Third Reich. And I read it. And I was amazed. Everybody around me was amazed that this young kid was reading, reading this very thick book about very political stuff. And, uh, and I found it once I lost the book, but I had written notes in it. It so captivated me. And the question began, and it still haunts me to this day, is how can that kind of evil exist? How could those people in the concentration camps do what they did? Or even in modern history, 1997 in Rwanda, how could, how could one group of people massacre their neighbors? So that almost, some say a million people, it's more like 800,000 to a million people were murdered in three months in a, in a very small country. How could that evil, the horror of some of the things that people do uh, exist? And... Um, I remember I had a friend, a prisoner in the church that was a police officer in New York City who retired, he retired very young. And he said it's because his, he just couldn't deal with the evil that was out on the streets of New York that we're not aware of. So there's a, see that how can even recently the destruction and murder of the Jews in Israel on October 7th. Not that what's going on in Gaza is any better, but how could a group of people go into a village, into an area, and just, just kill babies, rape women, um, mutilate infants? How could that happen? Where does that evil come from? And you can only call it evil. It's evil. How can war even exist? How can we do what we do to each other in war? I just don't understand for myself murder. How anybody can murder somebody? Now, I, did I not murder? Oh yeah, Jesus said, if I have anger in my heart, I'd murder somebody. And, and you know, there's people on the highway that shouldn't exist. But the anger sometimes that I've shown and had to confess, or anger and frustration with people I love. But how about the real murder, especially with one? I can never understand why one would murder one's wife murder one's children. See, so we can readily say, can't we, or at least I can, there but by the grace of God go I. Whatever's happening, 
Paul puts it that he's a wretched man. You know, the word wretched sounds really good. That we're wretched sinners. Not just sinners, but wretched sinners. Thanks be to God, though. Paul writes here in Romans chapter 7, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Listen, listen, the older I get, the more it comes down to this. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. I thank God that across from, I'm speaking into a, a, a laptop, but across over that laptop is a crucifix that was given to me. It's a large crucifix. And I look at that several times, many times during the day, just to remind myself that it's through what he has done. Again, as we're doing these teachings, I'm in Lent and we're coming up on Holy Week. And why is it called Good Friday? Because thanks be to God. This issue has been dealt with. The good news is that there's a way out of this terrible condition that we can find ourselves out of it. It's important that in the midst of massive, horrible evil, to know that there's always those who are led by the Spirit of Christ who bring light into the darkness. That's what God is working in us, that in the midst of all the evil that's around us, there are those who are led by the Spirit of Christ who bring light into the darkness. In the midst of the concentration camps, there's Corey Tenbloom and Edith Stein who became Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. Maximilian Colby, my grandson, has his middle name after, after Father Maximilian Colby, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and others who suffered in the concentration camp but they became light to those who were in darkness. There's also a great trilogy written by Eli Weissel called the Night Trilogy, Night, Dawn, and Day. It's well worth reading. It talks about this light in the midst of the darkness. See, there's so many others that are living out even today in the world. And we're called to do that. God wanting to work as us. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus. To set where there is hate, there is also so great love. That love shows forth this power that holds together the entire universe in us, through us. See, that's what we're called to deal with. And now Paul moves on, saying, here's this human condition. Here's this human condition. Memorize this verse. Because of Christ Jesus, what he has done, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Say hallelujah to yourself or yell it in the car with the windows up. Put a big smile on your face. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are not to live under a self-condemning spirit, nor are we to embrace condemnation that is thrown our way. Oh, there will be people who will try to condemn you. No, don't embrace it. You're too busy condemning yourself anyways. Don't accept it. Don't accept the condemnation of yourself. There is therefore now... No condemnation for Christ Jesus. Now, that's not saying that you can do whatever you want. No, you've been brought to a new place, a new new creation. Hebrews 9 talks about the blood being brought into the holy place, and it describes how the blood of Jesus is sufficient so that we can enter into the sanctuary of God, into his very presence through that blood. Jesus' death does not open the way for God to come into our presence. God is always in our presence. The Lord will meet you in the darkest place of sin and self-destruction. The Lord will meet you there. God will be present with you. 
The blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of love, opens the way for us to enter into the very Holy of Holies. In, in Jesus, God has done what the law, weakened by sin, could not do. That's Romans 8, verse 3. How? God sent his son because of his love for us, or in the bondage to flesh and crushed under sin. Those of us who find ourselves living in Romans chapter 7, which is all of us who are Christians who have been set apart, this letter is to Christians. It is the cross where sin and the flesh is then condemned. Why? So that the righteous requirement of the holy law, the way of righteousness and blessing, might be fulfilled in us. That's such incredible good news that merely teaching it to you now, really doing this recording, is refreshing my heart. I love Romans. I love these two chapters of Romans. It is fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. When we come to Jesus, we then determine to walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit at work in us. There's a great prayer. I think I've said it in other sessions. That is in uh, the 1928 prayer book, and I think in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer of the Anglican tradition. It's not in our Eucharistic prayers, but it's, it's a great prayer. It says, we do not presume to come to this uh, your table trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear son, Jesus Christ, and drink his blood, that he may evermore dwell in us and we in him. What a great prayer. May that prayer come true in your life today. Go find yourself a Eucharistic table in a liturgical church and embrace that as you walk up to receive communion. That he's dwelling in you and you're dwelling in him and he's working it out in you. You're loved by God. You're forgiven by God. God's not angry with you. And God will never leave you nor will he forsake you. We'll be back again. We're going to pick up in Romans chapter 8.